But I, I think, you know, Reed, when you talk about the state of exception, we're talking about in states of crisis, governments and typically corporate uh, the corporate sector as well, they tend to take advantage of states of crisis in general. And states use these as states of exception, like, okay, right now we're in a state of crisis, we have to impose strict measures. And within those contexts, it seems to me that that's when creeping authoritarianism kind of makes a leap forward. Uh, that's when we start to see things really move faster and faster in a more authoritarian direction. And you know, we saw that after 9-11, as Ali talked about, and uh, as you talked about in your, your piece, I mean, you know, the Patriot Act and the war on terror began and the surveillance state really kicked up a notch. I mean, like all the things that came out of that crisis, because people were in a state of crisis and panic and fear. And as Naomi Klein points to with the shock doctrine, that's when capitalists, that's when state, the states begin to which for more authoritarian measures or the yep. privatization of, of various public things, you know, deregulation. I mean, so I, I guess if, if I could just ask what this state of exception is and and how it applies to the situation, I guess I could ask Reed first about okay. that. And then Ali, if you want to jump in whenever. <laughs> so the state of exception was something that was identified first. It, it's always kind of existed, but it, it was an idea that was identified by Carl Schmitt. Carl Schmitt was um, the lead jurist for the, the Nazi regime. Every law that the, that the Nazis passed in order to implement their policy is pretty much, he, he was the architect of all of those. Um, and, and, and he wrote, and it was actually, I believe it was in one of his diaries that he first wrote it, but it was basically, he, he, he made the statement, sovereign is he who decides the exception. Which is to say that, 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 that true power, sovereignty as it were, comes from the ability to suspend the laws as you will. So you have the, you know, within liberal democracy, everything's the rule of law. Like we, we obey laws, you get punished for laws or for breaking laws, etc. Um, but, and, and it pretends as if that's just it, that there's, it's just laws, you know, like no one is above the law, etc. Except every government everywhere you know whether it was divine right kings before or emperors or you know our liberal democracies like as in the united states um you know there is always the ability for the sovereign whoever that is you know be that the president be that the government itself to make an exception and, and not just make an exception but 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 create a state of exception where those exceptions continue you know, another way of putting it is a state of emergency. Uh, Walter Benjamin spoke about this, where, um, you know, the state of emergency is something that the governments uh, declare at some point in the face of a crisis, be that existential or actual, you know, um, which, which is what we're seeing now, you know, state of emergencies or states of exception um, mm. within within Europe, China, South Korea, you know, everybody's doing it. The United States is starting to do it as well. But one of the things that, that really interested me was the way that everyone was acting as if this was unusual, as if this was a very brand new thing that governments would never do before. And, mm -hmm. and, and oh, we can't do that because that's, that's just, you know, governments don't do that. The thing is, the governments have done that repeatedly. In the United States, like, you know, we interned Japanese citizens. You know, I, I say we, but, you know, like, like the United States they kill black dudes on the street for no fucking reason. They make exceptions to the rule all of the time. In fact, it is constantly an exception. You know, it's like, this is the law, but then we violate this law because we can, and there's nothing you can do about this. And so where the law is, you know, that you can have public gatherings that the government cannot, you know, um, impinge upon your your freedom of speech your your freedom of press etc and and everyone's like oh i can't believe the government is doing now it's like your government has always done this mm -hmm. this is what governments do the governments have always had this power and and if we see this you know I, i'm looking beyond what's going to happen obviously we don't know what's going to happen it's all terrifying i have no idea I, you know i could be stuck here for five weeks um, maybe even longer. You know, they've talked about in France it, it being longer as well. We don't know what's going to happen, but after after this is done, 
we're going to all collectively want to have this idea that, wow, that was really bad. I'm glad that can't happen again. But, <laughs> but it will continue to happen again. And, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned Naomi Klein's idea on, on the shock doctor and, and, and disaster capitalism. Um, already we've seen in the United States, um, I wish I could remember which, there was an attorney general who was saying that we need to suspend um, mm. laws against habeas corpus and, and a couple of other things that you know, are requirements of the U.S. Constitution for three months while we're in the state ex- of exception. It's like we yeah. don't have time to deal with these things. You know, uh, you know, we can arrest people without warrants and just put them in there and then we can clear it up later. You're already seeing people trying to take advantage of this. And you'll see this much, 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 much more, especially within the United States, um, because the United States has no no strong left to constantly push back on this and, and no history of what it is like um, when governments do this, you know, even though even though, you know, the entire United States history is of the government doing these things, but they, they don't see it as that. So they won't know what's coming next. Right. Yeah. Uh, um, I'll just say this. I, I was actually pulled up the article about that, which I, uh, it's uh, William Barr, I think is his name, the attorney general. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's his first name, Barr. Mm-hmm. But yeah, he's. it says that the Trump Department of Justice had asked Congress to craft legislation allowing chief chief judges to indefinitely hold people without trial and suspend other constitutionally protected rights during coronavirus and other emergencies, according to a report by Politico's Betsy Woodruff Swan. So it, it's saying also that because it's the, the Democrats control the House of Representatives, that this might not go through, probably won't go through. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, the fact that they're even proposing something like this is an indication of the direction they're trying to go in. So anyway. Um, one thing I want to, I have two thoughts. Um, one being, I agree with everything Reed said with one notable exception. Um, I do think that what he's saying is much more limited to the United States in terms of this cultural forgetting and this idea that every time we, you know, we enter into this new state of exception that everyone thinks it's a brand new thing. And I do think that that's closely related. You know, there's just kind of this mass cultural forgetting that happens, um, again, you know, the shock of everyone, you know, around children in cages, you know, like we didn't do that to the Japanese in World War II, like we didn't do that to the Germans in World War I, um, like we didn't do such things to Native Americans for the past, you know, 200 plus years, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's very closely connected to American exceptionalism and to the idea that America is the freest country in the world, that, that you know, that that can't happen here, right? <laughs> this mm-hmm. the same, like, willful amnesia that liberals held through throughout 2016, thinking that there's no way Trump could possibly be elected because America's better than that. Um, Mm. And I say that, you know, in part being here. Um, And, you know, as much as 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 French people hate their government, they're they're not nearly as surprised, angry, shocked um, by the fact that everyone's on mandatory lockdown right now than than it would be if it had happened in the United States, which I think, you know, it, it might happen. At least it'll happen state by state. And it should happen. It should have happened two weeks ago. Um, and I really attribute the lack of, oh, my God, we're not, that's not who we are, to the fact that there's much more of a deep understanding here that that's actually that that's who we've always been, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of um, being a much more forceful police state in terms of constant crisis happening on on this land, right? I mean, you even look, I mean, it, within the lifetime of, of a senior citizen right now, right? Within the lifetime, you know, I live next door to an old age home, for example. So, you know, seeing the, the women on their balconies who, you know, I can tell aren't at all surprised by the fact that they can't leave the house. Um, mm-hmm. They lived through the Vichy regime. They lived through occupied France. They lived through a constitutional crisis of 1958. They lived through the the constant chaos that was the Algerian war and the way that that spilled over here. They lived through 68. <laughs> mm-hmm. They, you know, they've lived through so many periods. And and you know, frankly, the you know, the police state here even during, you know, normal times has, has been a much more stronger, much more aggravated, much more in your face, much more acting in a way that, you know, would cause Americans of all stripes to be like, you know, clutching their pearls and going on about my freedoms. 
Um, you know, people are used to that. Like the, the state of exception is much more normalized here. And there isn't the same kind of cultural forgetting as there is around, you know, especially affluent white Americans who, you know, in terms of like the crises that have hit the United States, they've disproportionately centered on specific demographics that aren't them. Mm -hmm. um, whereas here, you know, the things that I just mentioned are things that everybody went through and, and affluence didn't protect you from. Um, the other thing that I was really thinking um, when we talk about, you know, and I, I'm thinking back to 9-11 and, you know, this is something I, I didn't write about in my piece, you know, it didn't really apply, but I'm thinking about now is, you know, one dangerous thing that happens during these, these states of exception is that we institute um, rules, patterns, rituals, whatever, that long after the crisis has passed, then become normalized. Um, and, you know, there's, is, again, this kind of cultural forgetting that it, it was not always like this. I mean, you see that like on a national level with the Patriot Act. But, you know, again, as someone who was in New York City, um, living as a New Yorker on 9-11, you know, one of the, the greatest disruptions to daily life, which, you know, never changed, which are like, you know, now it's just just the status quo, right, was um, immediately needing to show an ID to do almost anything mm -hmm. uh, overnight, whether you're picking up your mail, whether you're getting on a train, whether, you know, I um, I worked as a delivery person both before and after 9-11. And after 9-11, there was this great all of a sudden um, uh, need in the market for delivery people because historically delivery was done by un undocumented immigrants. And after 9-11 happened, they couldn't gain access to buildings anymore because all of a sudden every single mm. fucking office building in New York City required you to show ID upon entrance for, you know, mm. again, at the time, reasons related to terrorism. 19 years later, that's, again, yeah, just accepted. It's just, just normalized. Normal. Exactly. And, you know, younger people don't remember a time where that ever wasn't the case. But to this day, you know, undocumented immigrants can no longer do food deliveries, um, which is something they did for decades because they cannot enter those buildings. And so, you know, that became something I remember at the very beginning, people being like, what? You know, you can't do that. And it's just, again, like, I think it's hard for people to remember a time. And I know younger people literally don't remember a time when that was never the case. And so I think that's, you know, one of the dangers that, you know, and it's a, it's a little thing on one hand. But on the other hand, it's, it's really not a little thing at all. And I, I think it's those little pieces, you know, we concentrate on the big things. We concentrate on things like the Patriot Act. But it's those little disrupt, those little things are able to slip into daily life that long after the actual tangible danger has passed, simply remain and, and do, you know, over time, you know, they, 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 they collectively become part of a much more authoritarian picture.